Hi there and welcome to Solutions in Minds Introductory to NLP. Now, even though the subject of NLP is vast and it can address lots of different areas, when you really get down to it, it's all really about one thing, and that's results. It's about improving the level of results in your personal life and improving the level of results that you achieve in your professional life. What it's not about is it's not like some wacky new age positive thinking where you walk into the garden and say, uh, you know, there's no weeds here, there's no weeds here, there's no weeds here, and then you open your eyes and the garden looks like the Amazon rainforest. That's not what it's about. It's about finding out what naturally works in the world and then using it to produce specific consistent results. Now NLP throughout the years has been described as many, many different things. It's been described as the study of human excellence, the ability to beat your best more often, and the new technology of achievement. When we get more in depth about NLP, what you find is that it's very much an all-purpose self-improvement um, technology that can be used in lots of different ways. Now, where it came from was it started in the 1970s by two very innovative gentlemen, one guy called Richard Bandler and the other one called John Grinder. And what they did was, at the time, they were studying how people change, how people move out of their problems and into solutions. And what they did was they developed a process called modelling. Now, modelling is where you take someone who does something really, really well, a model of excellence, so to speak. It could be a, a fantastic trainer, um, a wonderful manager, a coach, um, or even just someone who is a, a, an amazing parent or friend. It really doesn't matter. Someone who just does something really well that you would like to do. And then you find out what it is that they do, both physiologically with their body, what they, the, the behaviours that they engage in, the way that they act in the world, but also what they do psychologically as well inside their mind. And then you make a map of it and you can then use this map to either teach yourself how to do it or to teach someone else how to do it. Now, the thing is, when you use this modeling process, what happens is it allows you to learn a new skill in a fraction of the time it would normally take. And to give you an example, it's kind of like a program that used to be on quite a few years ago called Faking It. Now, if you haven't seen Faking It, Faking It is where they take someone, a member of the public, and they have like several weeks to turn them into um, someone who portrays some kind of skill. So for example, um, one of the people that they took was a, a sheep shearer from Aberdeen, and they had like several weeks to turn them into a Vidal Sassoon hairdresser. Now obviously what they didn't have was they didn't have the luxury of time. So they couldn't put him through you know, several months or several years of college to turn him into a really good hairdresser. So what they did was they took him and they coupled him with the top hairdressers of the country. And they got him to begin to duplicate what they did with their body, but also what they did with their mind as well. It got him to begin to duplicate um, the belief systems that they operated from, um, the thinking patterns, and also as well the gestures, the behaviours and the way that they acted in the world. And what they found was that not only did he manage to convince a panel of judges that he was this Vida Halsasun hairdresser, but that he also managed to learn this skill in a fraction of the time it would normally take. So this is very much like the modelling process. It's where you take someone who does something really, really well, find out what it is that they do, both psychologically and physiologically, make a map of it, and then use this to either teach yourself how to do it or to teach someone else how to do it in a fraction of the time it would normally take. Now the three early models were, first of all, a hypnotherapist called Milton H. Erickson, a relationship expert called Virginia Satir, and someone called Fritz Perl who did something called Gestalt therapy. And from these early models, from these um, early therapists, they developed um, certain ways of talking, certain ways of communicating that would allow you to get a message across to someone a lot more easily that could help them uh, change certain things in their life. But also they developed certain techniques, specific techniques and tools that you could use to change yourself uh, and also to become a more effective communicator. Now through time NLP has developed significantly 
and it can now be used to help you in lots of different areas. It can be used in therapy, in coaching, uh, training or public speaking, management, negotiation, um, sports psychology, communication skills, personal development and happiness, and a lot, lot more. Okay, now, first of all, I want to introduce you to a model in NLP, a very useful model called eye accessing cues. Now, eye accessing cues are essentially a way of finding out how a person reveals their thought processes through their eye movements. And this is tremendously useful because the more that you know about what's going on inside someone's mind, the more influence that you can have over it, um, the more rapport you can develop with the person, and just the more that you'll be able to understand where they're coming from as well. So this is very important from a, a communication uh, perspective. Now, before we even get to eye access and cues, I want to talk a little bit about how the mind works. Because throughout our life, we take in absolutely everything through our five senses. Sight, sound, taste, touch and smell. But if we were to be consciously aware of all this stuff at the one time, this would completely overwhelm us. So what our brain does is something really quite neat, is it takes all this information and it filters it down into more manageable chunks, into what we call our map or our model of the world. Now, there are three types of filters. First of all, we generalize information, we distort information, and then we delete stuff as well that we don't think is valuable or we don't think it is, is appropriate for the situation. And our brain does this unconsciously. So in other words, what we generally perceive as being reality is not really reality. It's only our uh, watered down or filtered out version of what the world actually is. That the world has um, an infinite number of possibilities that we're not really thinking about at the moment because of the way that our brain filters this information down. Now this is incredibly important from a communication uh, perspective because the way that you see the world is, is not the way the actual world is. So uh, when someone you're presenting an idea to someone, you've got to realize that uh, they're only seeing it from their perspective. So in order to become a more effective communicator, you want to begin to get more of an understanding about where a person is at, about what their map of the world is like, and eye accessing cues allows you to do this. So that's kind of the way that we process information. The thing is, when it comes to internal communication as well, we also communicate through the five senses. Now, generally speaking, unless you are an animal or a dog or a cat or something like that, you don't really use taste and smell very much when you're communicating internally. The, the three main ones are sight, sound, and touch or feelings. Now in NLP, we give these different names. We call sight, we call that visual. So we'll give that V for visual. We call sound, we call that auditory. So we'll give that an A for auditory. And we also replace touch and feelings with a word called kinesthetic. So if you hear me use the word kinesthetic, all I'm really saying there is touch or feelings. So we'll give that a K for kinesthetic. Now, if you think about this, this, this is pretty much common sense. We're all, most of us are aware that we make pictures inside our minds. Perhaps when we're organizing something or we're uh, thinking ahead, uh, we play a little movie inside our mind or if we're replaying uh, an event or an experience that has just happened to us we'll we'll go back and we'll reminisce and, and do stuff like that and um, we also hear sounds usually in these internal movies or in these internal pictures and i'm sure we'll, we're all aware as well that we have an internal voice that that we that, that talks to ourselves all day uh, it doesn't mean you're crazy it just means that's just the way that we communicate to ourselves uh, through this internal voice and of course, we're all aware that we have feelings as well and we experience sensations inside our body as well. 